All right. Uh, Dean Dickerson, Professor Sarat Vishnupak, Advisory Board Member Adam Kelly, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daryl Liv. I'm professor here at the John Marshall Law School and the director for the Center for IP Information and Privacy Law. It's, we are delighted to invite and welcome all of you to our first event this calendar year. I'm very pleased to welcome Sarab. I should say welcome back because he clucked across the street at the Northern District of Illinois for Judge uh, Derry Yejin, uh, first immigrant Armenian Federal District Court Judge. I first met Sarab in the cornfields of Des Moines, Iowa <laughs> at an IP professor's conference. I don't know how he got there because he wasn't quite an IP professor yet, but he left a deep impression on me with his very thoughtful analysis and his passion for all things related to the PTO. Uh, in fact, I remember one of the few times he liked a Facebook post that I had put on Facebook was <laughs> when I had invited then Chief Judge of the PTAP and the USPTO, uh, Nate Kelly, to come and speak. Now, I've asked our advisory board madam, uh, member, Adam Kelly, to introduce our speaker. So I won't say more about Surat, but I will say something about Adam. Adam is a graduate from the John Marshall Law School, co-founder of, of Ripple. And by the way, Surat has published not once, but twice in Ripple. So f folks from Ripple who are here today, please convince him that three times the charm. <laughs> Um, Adam Kelly is one of the best known patent attorneys here in Chicago and I'm so pleased that he has agreed to continue serving on our advisory board uh, despite knowing that it's going to be a smaller board this year and we've got more to do than ever before but we are very excited about what we have in store and uh, watch this space. Now, I do want to thank a few people uh, and make a few short announcements before we start. First of all, I want to thank our student ambassadors, uh, Paul Sanders, Kaylee Willis, Gina Sharek, and Daniel Mobley. Thank you so much for being part of what we do. Uh, I also want to thank Lisa Rudos, the assistant director for the centers, as well as uh, Katie Potvin. Kathy had just joined us last week uh, as assistant to the director and both of them have been terrific in helping put this event together. Now, announcements, all of you should have received our spring 2017 newsletter coming in. We had a busy fall semester, and you will find in the newsletter a list of all our events, not just through this semester, but all the way till November, where we have our annual conference on November 3rd. Now, Please stay engaged with us. We have a center website. We have a Facebook page. We are trying something new this time. We're always thinking of what we can do new and better. This time we decided not only are we going to stream the event, we are going to stream the event on Facebook. So we are, we'll be taking questions from the live audience here. And you guys get first dips because you guys are here. But we're also going to take questions from folks uh, on YouTube and on Facebook. And we're going to keep uh, posting videos of our events uh, so that we can stay engaged. And that's what we really want to do. We want to connect to the IP community, to the students, to the alums, to the attorneys, and in our small way, provide a forum where people can debate about the issues of the day and influence the outcomes. Now, finally, but not least, I'm very delighted to uh, have introduce Dean Darby Dickinson, who will give her opening remarks. Uh, Dean Dickinson joined us just a few weeks ago, and she comes from Texas Tech. So this is a special day here at John Marshall, two Texas connections right here in one room. Uh, she's already made a big difference in her short time at John Marshall. She's met our advisory board. We had a nice long conversation on Friday afternoon. Uh, where, amongst other things, she told me a funny story about a fish. Now, the support of the administration is so important to what we do, and I already feel that she's going to be one of our greatest supporters. So, Dean Dickerson, please. 
Thank you, Daryl. Welcome to everyone who's live with us today and who's viewing this online. This is very exciting. I know this is the third time we've tried this format, and I want to commend Daryl for his vision and creativity, thinking about ways to connect our law school to the practicing bench and bar, to other law students, and to, to others, even non-lawyers who might be involved and interested in this IP, specifically today, patent field. The IP Center is incredibly important to John Marshall. It has a long tradition of excellence, and I am fully committed to making sure that we continue to be an entity that's relevant, that has an impact, and brings knowledge and information to the field more generally. I'm, I'm also very excited that the first speaker here with us today is my friend from Texas A&M. Um, Sabrav and I actually go back a long way because his cousin Vanita was one of my outstanding students when I was dean at Stetson University College of Law. So students, it is a very small world and, and remember that you never know who you're going to run into. So I'm excited that Rob could be with us to share information in this important area. And again, I thank all of you for participating. We welcome your feedback and your ideas. And again, thanks to, to Daryl and to Bill and to everyone connected with the center for making this event both possible and the success I know it will be. At this point, I'll turn it over to Adam. Well, good afternoon. My name is Adam Kelly. I'm an equity partner at the law firm of Loeb and Loeb here in the Chicago office. Uh, just hearing the, the school name Texas Tech, uh, being born and bred in Indiana, I followed the uh, philosopher Robert Montgomery Knight, who coached basketball at Texas Tech. So I'm actually a Texas Tech basketball fan, um, although I disagree with the philosophy of Bob Knight, but that's <laughs> aside from itself. Um, in Daryl's opening remarks, he mentioned that the IP Advisory Board uh, had recently met. And so on behalf of the IP Advisory Board and our chair, uh, Don Dunner, who is a partner at Finnegan in Washington, D.C., um, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, if many of you are unfamiliar with the school or are familiar with the school but maybe uh, have lost touch, uh, I'd like to share a few things that we discussed at the meeting and I could probably uh, save you from reading the newsletter, although I do want you to read the newsletter because it's a good one. Um, but I had a few things that I had written down that I, I thought were worth mentioning. One is to remind you of the long history of the IP program here at John Marshall. It spans over 80 years uh, since US News and World Reports first created an IP specialty ranking. The John Marshall Law School has always been ranked. Its ranking has changed from year to year, but we've always been ranked. Um, we were looking at the student data at our meeting and roughly one-third of all students who enter John Marshall as 1L have an interest in intellectual property. So clearly the Center for Intellectual Property is very central to what this law school does among the other curriculum that it offers. And it's for that the IP Advisory Board will be looking into along with uh, the Center and its faculty uh, our courses to see if we can have more hands-on practical courses, to see if we are offering current courses that are staying in step with the emergence of new areas of law, such as privacy and, and so forth. Um, at John Marshall, we have a deep and supportive alumni network. We recently just had an alumni reception in Washington, D.C., uh, as well as Orlando, and we had events that were held at the AIPLA annual conference as well as the INTA annual conference. We're presently planning one for Austin, Texas, so anybody who's listening online who will be in Texas, maybe a Texas-themed uh, <laughs> afternoon, uh, we, we will certainly be there. Um, I welcome everyone who is uh, listening to us streaming live on Facebook. For me, this is very exciting. This is the first time I've ever present, well, I'm not presenting, I'm presenting this guy, but spoken to a Facebook audience other than when I post things about my kids or my family, hoping that my extended members uh, will take a look at it. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Prof Professor Vishnubakht. First try, got it right? All right. Uh, 
you know, I was joking with him earlier about the pronunciation of his name. I said, you know, my name's pretty simple, and people call me Alan or Andy or all kinds of other <laughs> things that aren't mine. But anyway, uh, we're very lucky to have him. He's an associate professor of law at Texas A&M University. He's a fellow at the Duke, law, the Duke Law Center for Innovation Policy. He's the former expert advisor to the chief economist for the United States Patent and Trademark Office. He has a, a BS in biochemistry from Georgia Tech. Where are the rambling wreck? JD and LLM from Franklin Pierce. Now something fun that I've, I've learned is, is he's an amateur expert on all things involving the Simpsons <laughs> and will frequently go out of his way to include quotes from the Simpsons not only to his students in class but also in answering uh, posts on social media. So without further ado, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, my thanks to, to Dean Dickerson, to Daryl for, for having me, and to Andy for that very kind introduction. <laughs> I'm just kidding, yeah. <laughs> no, um, it really is a pleasure to be here. I've uh, uh, always enjoyed coming uh, to visit Chicago. I lived here during law school and uh, worked across the street for Judge Derry Egan as a law student, as, as Daryl mentioned. And the legal community here has always seemed to me a very uh, supportive and collegial one. And that's one of the things that, uh, that I've enjoyed most about being not only a lawyer, but a legal academic. And, uh, and I know that uh, you've got a great lineup for, for the rest of this semester. So uh, I'm particularly honored to be in the company of the other speakers who will follow uh, in this series. Uh, I guess I should uh, switch over. Here we go. Yeah. So the topic of my talk, Patent Mistakes in the Administrative State, uh, takes as its premise that patent mistakes have been around for a long time, and it's particularly in the administrative state that uh, our attention has, has moved, right? So uh, when we think about patent mistakes, there are two stories that we can tell. One is a story about what kinds of mistakes we see, and uh, there's a well-rehearsed literature, both in law and economics, about false positives versus false negatives. How can we measure these things econometrically? Um, the timing of these uh, mistakes, whether they take place uh, ex ante during examination or ex post during litigation or administrative review. Uh, and there's an excellent paper by, um, by my friend Andres Sawicki at the University of Miami about uh, making better patent mistakes, right, when we think about timing and, and legal grounds and things. Um, but what I'd like to focus on is uh, a different set of criteria by which we measure the kinds of mistakes we see. There are factual mistakes. I'll discuss uh, what in particular I mean by that. Legal mistakes that the agency can make or that courts can make. Uh, retroactive mistakes, which poses a particularly interesting problem and builds on this issue of timing. And then finally, the elusive case that there is no mistake so far as we can tell uh, and what to do about that as uh, designers of a system for, for patent validity, right? And then the second story is whom do we ask? When we find a mistake, whom do we ask to correct it? Traditionally, of course, it was the federal courts and it only came up collaterally because if you make a mistake uh, uh, in patent examination and the mistake is that the patent should have been granted but was denied instead, the applicant immediately has recourse to an appeal. You can appeal all the way up to the Supreme Court, and we've seen many famous cases go up that way. But if a patent is granted, the agency does not appeal. Once it's granted, you go out into the world and, and sort of make your way. And if the mistake was made that a patent was incorrectly granted, it can only come up as a defense to an infringement action or maybe a declaratory judgment suit. But of course, since 1980, the administrative setting has been another place that we could turn to for corrections with ex parte re-exam created by the, uh, the 1980 patent reforms, inter partes re-exam in 1999, and now most recently the American Invents Act creates a whole suite of administrative options that we can rely on. So with respect to the types of mistakes, factual mistakes, um, and I'll sort of address each of these in broad fashion. Each of these is a subject of uh, considerable ongoing research. Uh, the field of the relevant invention. This is something that's not talked about a lot in the literature, 
and, uh, and I've taken, uh, taken it upon myself to try and fix that. Uh, a recent paper of mine discusses what impact taxonomy in the patent system actually has on mistakes that might be made either in examination or ex post in litigation. So if the field of invention is understood too broadly, right, the field is pediatric leukemia, but we're gonna say it's cancer. What are the effects of that kind of mistake? Well, one might be that potentially irrelevant prior art is gonna be drawn into the analysis. The examiner might cite stuff uh, against the application that really has no bearing on the invention as the inventor understands it. Uh, ex post, it might be used to invalidate the patent. Uh, and all this irrelevant prior art is gonna be used and that's uh, inappropriate, right? If we understand that the, the problem is that the field is too broad. Conversely, if the field is defined too narrowly, then okay, fine, you're not gonna have all this potentially irrelevant prior art. In fact, you might be under-inclusive with respect to the prior art, but the scope of the invention is also going to be commensurately narrower and infringers who might otherwise have been on the hook are just gonna get away scot-free. And the question then becomes, should we try to strike this balance in favor of uh, broad scope, narrow scope? How do we decide? Right, so my paper, which is now forthcoming in the Hofstra Law Review, uh, gets into this issue. And the result of this tension is uncertainty. As is always uh, the case when we're trying to design an efficient system of adjudication, of granting property rights, uncertainty is something we're always struggling with because we're operating under a veil of incomplete information. So if uh, inventors are both concerned that the field might be defined too broadly for purposes of prior art or too narrowly for purposes of infringement scope, they might simply shy away from telling you what they think the field of the invention is. There's a, uh, a spot, a blank in the application, in the spec, where you say the field of my invention is X, right? The invention pertains to X. And as I discuss in my paper, uh, over time, the last 20 years, the amount of information that applicants give us has declined sharply. 95% of applications, published applications, used to include a field of invention summary as recently in the patent system as 20 years ago. And uh, just a few years ago, two or three years ago, that number is closer to 50% now. So we have an information suppression mechanism in a sort of body of law where we're always trying to force more information, trying to get the applicant to tell us more. And that, that can be a type of factual mistake. Um, how to correct for that? Well, it's an administrative adjudication of fact, uh, and it takes place on the way to more substantial findings uh, regarding patent validity. So what I recommend in the paper is treat it like any other informal adjudication of fact. Give it arbitrary and capricious deference. It's a way of deferring to what the patent office has done. They have expertise in this. If the courts try to do this, they're, uh, they're gonna face an uphill battle and administrative law provides a solution. Right? So this is one way in which a factual uh, problem can be solved in an administrative setting, and then if it goes to the courts later, we have a ready-made solution. Another type of factual mistake, and this is the one that uh, patent litigators are probably more familiar with, is the prior art that the examiner failed to find. So it's a very common complaint, and it matters a lot for things like the presumption of validity. Uh, just a few years ago, the Supreme Court decided the I4I versus Microsoft case and a lot of people in that case were concerned that, look, if you had prior art that the examiner considered and just had a difference of opinion on, that's one thing. But if you've got whole new prior art that was never even before the office, then is it really reasonable for the patent system to say that this should still enjoy a presumption of validity that has to be overcome by clear and convincing evidence? That was a very live policy debate during that, uh, that case. And of course, the Supreme Court said, yes, the presumption of validity still applies and we still need clear and convincing evidence, but that's a type of factual mistake that the agency uh, and the courts struggle with. Now, legal mistakes, the application of patentability requirements. Uh, this, of course, is uh, of perennial interest to the patent office because to be a patent examiner requires no law degree. Right? To be a trademark examiner does require that, interestingly, but to be a patent examiner, it's more important that you know the science than that you know the law. And if you have legal judgments or implications, uh, judgments with legal implications that you have to make, then we'll give you a decision tree. Right? The senior members of, a, of an art unit, the TC directors, may well have law degrees. People in the agency leadership usually have law degrees, but examiners, line examiners, are not required to have law degrees, and they get their legal training in a much more black letter fashion. 
And so it's perhaps not surprising that when they're applying innovation-related uh, requirements like novelty, non-obviousness, utility, or uh, disclosure-related requirements like written description, enablement, and the best mode requirement, that they might make mistakes. They're not lawyers, and so of course they're uh, likely to make legal mistakes. What is the effect of that? Well, in litigation, it's often the case that we try to fix these problems by saying that, well, the examiner screwed up. We've got clear and convincing evidence of that. But the new law that we create along the way, the interstitial law that we create along the way, the law of non-obviousness changes when a particularly new case comes up, like KSR, for example. In those situations, what we're really saying is, here's what the law was all along. And we're not saying that it used to be that non-obviousness was a very low bar, and now non-obviousness is a much more strict requirement, right? pre and post KSR, might, as the case might be. But even though that's the practical outcome, what the Supreme Court in KSR was saying, or the Supreme Court in Alice for 101 was saying, is that this is what the law was all along, and the mistake was made under an incorrect understanding of the law. And the reason that matters, uh, I'll get to in just a moment. But how we, matter, how we uh, deal with it, how this matters in litigation, is increasingly we're trying to use subject matter eligibility as a shortcut to these other forms of patentability, these other requirements for patentability constraining. Right? In examination, we have compact prosecution, which means that if an examiner sees a subject matter eligibility problem and a non-obviousness problem and an enablement problem, she will give it all to the applicant at once and say, in a single rejection, here are all the problems. The reason we do that is we don't want multiple rounds of back and forth and administrative efficiencies are achieved. In litigation, that's costly. If a court can knock out a patent on one ground, the other five that might pose a problem are of no interest. What we want is to just be as quick as possible and, and stage these things. So if we prioritize among requirements, should a court evaluating the validity of a patent after the fact look at subject matter eligibility first, or should they look at it last? It's a threshold requirement, so if they look at it first, nothing else matters. Right? If they look at it last, then they're least likely to make a mistake because enablement, written description, novelty, non-obviousness, all these things are evaluated from the perspective of a person having ordinary skill in the art. And in order to make the judgment, you need to engage in claim construction. So you've gotten a very well-defined problem in front of you after discovery, after claim construction, after the FOSDA analysis, and the decision you make will be narrow, it'll be well-defined, less likely to be incorrect. Okay, so that's how we think about it from a patent mistakes perspective. Courts might say, well, we don't think we're going to make a mistake. We want to do 12b6. We want to do this right at the pleading stage before costly, you know, uh, lengthy, complex discovery. And so that's a tension that's currently ongoing in the courts. I have another paper uh, that discusses the use of 101 in this fashion, the use of subject matter eligibility. I personally come down against it, but there are important arguments on both sides. Right? So these are a few examples of some legal mistakes in the patent system that can be made by examiners or by trial courts after the fact. And retroactive mistakes. This is the problem of the law changing under our feet. If something is considered a mistake today, we obviously have to account for the fact that imperfect information was available to us yesterday or a year ago. Right? What that means is that what we're really asking is whether, in the case of a prior art, the examiner should have found prior art. We need to evaluate objectively, as objectively as possible, what amount of effort, what amount of uh, energy and resources should the examiner have expended at the time, what the prevailing understanding of uh, best practices were at the time, and ultimately, was it reasonable or was it sufficient? Right? Reasonable is one standard of sufficiency. We could have others. But if the examiner did everything the examiner was supposed to do, and we still just end up with something, a patent, that we now have to consider inaccurately granted, do we still consider that a mistake? Yes or no. If we consider it a mistake, should that mistake be tolerated? Yes or no. And depending on which combination of yeses and nos you pick, the implications for institutional design at the patent office look quite different. Right? 
intuitively, we should at least believe that the answer to the last question, should it still be considered a mistake? Um, should we no longer consider it a mistake? Uh, should be no. It should still be considered a mistake because our information is improved in litigation. That's the idea. Right? So back here, is failure to find prior art no longer a mistake? No. It is still a mistake because even though the examiner had poor information back then, we have better information now. So at most, we might talk about tolerating mistakes in the way that the I4I court did. Okay? So that's the sort of intuitive answer on the factual side, but now the legal side, the legal mistake. An incorrect application of the enablement requirement, the obviousness requirement, might look quite different. And what I mean by that is, if the prevailing understanding that was given to these non-lawyers who examine patents was correctly applied according to the guidance they're given by their supervisory patent examiners, by their TC directors, and ultimately the agency leadership, if all of that was done as it was supposed to be done, if the classification system that you used to find prior art worked as it was supposed to work, if you gave the applicant all the grounds for rejection under compact prosecution as you were supposed to give, what then do we do when the Supreme Court comes out with Alice? And now all of these things that were issued under a State Street Bank standard of subject matter eligibility are not coming before us. Is that the patent office getting it wrong? Or is that just the legal landscape shifting under our feet about which there's not much anybody can do? Right? That's the question that we can try and get a handle on when we think about mistakes in the, in the administrative setting. And it also forces us to ask, can the PTO or any institutional actor be reasonably expected to predict how the law is going to change over time. The Supreme Court's going to do what it's going to do. The Federal Circuit's going to do what it's going to do. They're going to do it with the cases they have in front of them uh, because that's how we adjudicate cases. Right? With that as food for thought, let's turn, how, turn to how we might explore this question empirically. A lot of my work uh, is empirical. I try to offer data whenever possible. And there are several sets of data that are needed for this. Right, this isn't the sort of one data set and you're done kind of thing. What we need is some information about the overall population of rejections that examiners issue. Once we have that, we can drill down into that subset of examiner rejections for patents that go on to be challenged in the PTAB. Right, their validity is in question and they're challenged in the PTAB. Uh, in a corollary set of research threads, I'm also exploring what happens in litigation, but uh, focusing on the administrative side, once they're in the PTAB, what grounds for challenge are now asserted in the PTAB? For those patents that are challenged, there's the file history, that's the before, and there's the grounds on which they're challenged now, that's the after. You compare the two of them, you start to find interesting patterns. And the rates of institution across the grounds on which challenges are made, whether it's subject matter eligibility, whether it's novelty, non-obviousness, uh, or anything else, this is the subject of a multi-year collaborative effort, and what I'll offer you are some initial findings so far, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, name my very capable co-authors uh, on the what's going on ex ante in the, the uh, examination process, annex post in the PTAB portion of it. I'm working with Alan Marco, who's the chief economist uh, of the patent office, my former boss, uh, and Dave Schwartz, who's a, a former member of uh, the John Marshall faculty and is now at uh, Northwestern. So I'm working with uh, Dave and Alan on that project, and then on the, uh, the institutional sort of whom do we ask for correcting the problem, courts or the agency, uh, which I'll get to later in this talk. I'm working with Artie Rye, who's my former advisor at Duke Law School, and Jay Kaysen at the University of Illinois. So some uh, initial findings that we have. The changes in law that we see are likely driven by um, changes in the law and not just by uh, factual examiner errors like prior art, at least where certain grounds for rejection are concerned. And I'll show you some, some charts that illustrate what I mean. Obviously, these two effects are not mutually exclusive, but some things we might expect to see if the law was you know, the same and prior art is all that's driving this, we would expect to see those effects. We don't see those effects. Some differences we would expect to see don't exist. And that suggests that the law changing is playing a role. And then in related research, um, there's ample evidence, not just from my research, but from many others, that these effects are technology specific. 
Right? So unpredictable arts, such as drugs and medical technologies, uh, obviousness gets you a lot more mileage. Written description, enablement, the same effect. This is something that even the case law recognizes that in an unpredictable field, a little bit of a change is going to have a big difference. And so when you go to make a change, whether you find something is foreseeable, whether a person of ordinary skill would have anticipated this effect, a little bit of a change can be enough. Now that does mean you have to enable a lot more because the FOSDA can't be expected to fill in the gaps. And so experimentation is also more likely to be found undue. Right? So the way in which predictable versus unpredictable arts play out, the way in which um, fields in which a standard nomenclature, like chemistry or biotech, uh, is compared with a field where there's no standard nomenclature, like software, uh, it's going to be much harder to pin down the same effects. And here's an example. Let's consider PTAB challenged patents, okay, and the grounds for which they are challenged. They can be challenged on 101, 102, 103, 112 grounds in CBM review, and 102 and 103 in IPR, right? For those patents in the PTAB, where the examiner previously rejected, issued a rejection on that patent, on the same grounds that it's now being challenged on, versus not. Does that make a difference with respect to institution? In other words, here in 101, we've got a bunch of patents. During examination, the examiner uh, ins also issued a 101 rejection. Okay? And then we compare the ones that were instituted versus the ones that were not. What is the rate of institution, the rate of non-institution? In all four of these grounds for rejection, there's no statistically significant difference between the likelihood that you're going to get instituted versus not. Okay? And you would expect to see that it would be the case. There should be some difference if it's really the examiner who screwed up. There was a 103 problem with this invention all along. The examiner missed it. We're catching it for the first time in the PTAB. Okay? So no 103 rejection in the file wrapper, but a 103 rejection or a 103 challenge in the PTAB should make a difference in the likelihood of institution, if that's what's going on. The fact that it's not what's going on, the likelihoods are equal. There's no, even in the 101, the numbers look different, but there's no statistically significant difference. That suggests that the law may have changed under our feet. And if we look at the flip side of this, the examiner did not reject on the same ground. Again, no statistically significant difference as between the two. Okay? Institution versus non-institution, no statistically significant difference. Now, what makes me think this is particularly likely to show, uh, I mean, this is the dog that didn't bark. So how do we know that this is really pointing to a change in the law? Well, consider this comparison on the one hand versus this comparison again on the other hand. The two bars in each category are equal to each other, but compare the 101 uh, difference here with the 101 difference here, where the examiner did not reject on the same ground the difference between institution and non-institution is virtually nothing. There's no statistically significant difference. But the actual rate is much higher than, oh, sorry, than when the examiner did issue on the same ground. Right? So this means that the ground is what makes the difference, not what the examiner did with respect to institution or not. Yeah, question. This is, the in, this is the institution rate. So these are, these are IPRs? And IPRs and CBMs. OK. Yeah. So the instituted and you're looking at which ones the, the patent office chose to institute versus not. Correct. And for those, I'm comparing the grounds on which they're challenged now and the grounds on which they may or may not have been challenged by the examiner during prosecution. Right. So the fact that there are these substantial differences, particularly in 101, suggests that the law is indeed what's driving uh, at least some of this change. Now, with that, let me turn a little bit to the forum for correcting mistakes. I want to make sure we have ample time for questions as well. All right. Administrative error correction, the motivations are pretty well rehearsed, both in public policy debates, in the literature, and now even uh, in the news on NPR. Right, the, the Patent Office is more efficient, more accessible, 
and God forbid more accurate because there are scientifically trained administrative patent judges rather than generalist uh, Article III district judges. Uh, in a paper with R.D. Rye and Jay Kaysen, we find that the standard model, what we term the standard model of substitution, we would have gone to district court, but now we go to the agency instead. And the standard model is we do that. Instead of going to the court, we go to the agency instead after we've been sued. So it's a defensive posture. We've been sued over here. Rather than duke it out in the courts, we're going to go over to the agency for a validity opinion. Okay? That happens in the majority of cases, 70% of the time. Um, it's a PTAB petitioner who is a district court defendant on a prior suit as to the same patent. But in 30% of cases, a substantial minority, it's preemptive. The petitioner is not a previous defendant. The petitioner is striking first, either because they've seen one of their other industry rivals get tagged with it, or somehow the, exam the uh, patent owner has tipped its hand, and so now there's some fear of suit, or just we want this patent out so we can get freedom to operate. 30% of cases, we've got preemptive strikes. Now, what does that mean? Well, because standard substitution is the prevailing uh, sort of mode by which PTAB review is used, we made the argument at the time that the PTAB should use a claim construction standard that mirrors that of the district courts. Of course, we lost that fight because the Supreme Court in Quozo upheld a, uh, the use of a different claim construction standard. But if it had been uniform, then PTAB constructions could plausibly have been used by district courts, and we could have gotten even more efficiency, more gains out of the administrative process. Okay? The court in Quozo decided against it. Um, but of course, non-standard substitution remains in play as well. The frequency of petitioners. This is something that we found is very interesting. We compare the frequency of petitioners who bring non-standard challenges. This is preemptive strikes. Uh, varies by technology. And what also varies by technology is the tendency of these non-standard petitioners to join other people who are uh, suing for defensive reasons. Okay, so this is a joinder problem, and we're uh, writing a separate paper about this. Let me show you what I mean by this. This is the share of standard petitioners, the share of petitioners in a field who are standard, right? So we've got chemical, computer and communications patents, drugs and medical patents, electrical patents, <coughs> mechanical patents. We do this with uh, this classification with the US patent class mapped to the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, taxonomy system. It's a six part system we use it for simplification. So for example, in drugs and medical, of all petitioners who bring PTAB claims, right, 48.5% of them are standard petitioners. They are responding to a, uh, a prior lawsuit against them uh, on the same patent that they are now challenging. Compare this, not to petitioners, but to petitions. The number of petitions on which you can have multiple petitioners, in which the defensive posture is assumed, right? the petition is filed by at least one person who has previously been sued, drugs and medical is up to 70.8%. So the majority of drugs and medical petitions are brought by at least one person who is a standard defendant, but the petitioners themselves, you're down to 48.5%. That means the majority of petitioners are acting preemptively. The disparity tells us that petitioners who are in these challenges are joining up with standard petitioners. They're solving a collective action problem. No one person wants to be the one to institute a PTAB review because if they win, then yeah, they get the benefits of it, but so do all their competitors. So why should they foot all the, the costs and let the benefits spill over to their rivals as well, right? That's a, a classic PTAB or a classic litigation collective action problem ever since Blonder Tongue. In this day, we are starting to see what looks like beneficial collective action. The problem is we don't know if it's actually that or if it's just, hey, look, somebody's getting harassed over here with a PTAB petition. Let's pile on, right? Let's jump on to something that somebody has already started. It could be socially beneficial collective action. It could be a form of harassment. In order to figure it out, we need to look individually at petitions, and that's the subject of our ongoing research. All right. So with that, I'll open the floor for questions. There's a lot here, and, uh, and I welcome your perspective, uh, particularly as practitioners. Thank you.
Now, do you want to take your question standing up or do you want to sit down? Um, I'll sit down. Okay. I play the law professor most days. Thanks. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Let's do this. You're All right, so now to what extent, I know you tease this in your paper, which is a great way for people to look for the sequel. That's right. Um, but to what, to what extent you distinguish between harassment versus collective action? Mm -hmm. um, is this harassment versus collective action? And does it differ between different industries? And you talked about, you're looking at into this, to what extent have you found more concrete data pointing one way or the other? Okay, so I think it does vary by technology and probably does vary by industry already as we've seen, whatever this effect is. Whether the difference between the share of petitioners and the share of petitions um, is due to harassment or due to collective action, it definitely varies. Whatever it is, it varies by technology. Okay, the question for us has to be how to measure um, the magnitude of these differences. So one way to do that, uh, and this is what, uh, what we're doing in the second paper, uh, Artie and Jay and I, is looking at serial petitions, mm -hmm. right? So when a particular challenge against the same patent is carved up into multiple petitions, and those petitions are brought, you know, seriatim, then that could be uh, a form of harassment because you're now forcing somebody to uh, defend seven cases instead of one. Uh, the cases may well be consolidated, but things like, you know, the PTAB, as mundane as the PTAB page limit, uh, the limits on discovery, and the unavailability of review on refusals of the PTAB to grant fact finding. These sorts of questions really hamper the ability of the party, the patent owner in a defensive posture, uh, to, to make a reasonable case in, in many situations. And so if that's the case, it may fairly be characterized as a form of harassment. If, on the other hand, the um, parties that are bringing the challenge each have a different piece of prior art or a different sort of you know, uh, argument to make, and they're joining for uh, sort of coordinating their attack, as it were, or reaping the benefits of working together and so everybody knows who's in the room. You know, those are the parties that have a stake in all of this. Uh, that could plausibly be described as a as beneficial collective action because, without that, some prior art might be left off the table. Some arguments might not be made. And we, what we really need to do is drill down into this and get both objective measures like the concentration of serial petitioning by technology, by party, whether there are uh, particular parties who have. Uh, not only no stake in this, but you know, if they have no patents in this area, they don't themselves practice in this area, then you might get closer to the purely strategic behavior, uh, as we've heard in cases where people will short the stock of a company and then file a PTAB petition to uh, you know, sort of reap the, the purely financial benefits without any intention of ever practicing in that field. So those sorts of hypotheses, those sorts of anecdotes uh, are compelling, but we need to get behind them and really uh, drill down into the data quite a bit more before we can say for sure. All right, thanks, Rob. And as you can see, I do have a list of questions from you. Very interesting paper. But um, I want to make sure there's enough time for folks in the audience. And I've invited Adam Kelly to stay on the panel because um, we really want this not just to be uh, a, a doctrinal policy discussion, which is great, but also with a real world practical focus to it. So. Adam, any thoughts or questions? Uh, I have one comment, and that's, you know, I think the word harassment is an interesting one because uh, my personal experience in dealing, in counseling clients who are seeking to challenge patents, uh, there's usually a business reason for why they're doing so. Mm -hmm. They're either going to be uh, challenging the portfolio of non-practicing entities um, or they are challenging uh, rogue patents which they don't believe are valid and those patents are a barrier to their decision making for a certain product launch or there's a certain process they want to get into and it really it's it's really business driven and if part of that business driven uh, tactic is to file more than one petition mm -hmm. then you know there's a justifiable reason for it I, I haven't I personally haven't seen 
or been involved with a joint defense group where we get together and say, you know what, we could probably have two petitions, but let's turn it into 12. And let's file one every Friday and giggle every time we hit file. Do we sit, send over to the patent office because we know that the patent owner is going to have to spend real money mm -hmm. to defend them? Well, you know, part of me, and this is biased for the clients who have defended, you know, if we're, if we're taking down a patent portfolio of a non-practicing entity and we don't believe that they should be in possession of those patents anyway, mm -hmm. there's no love lost on our part from trying to tear down those patents. Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Hold on. So just for the benefit of people who are listening on live, we're not passing around a mic. So a name affiliation question, and then I'll repeat, and then you can answer. Go ahead. Uh, Paul Rausch, Evan Law Group. So obviously the term harassment has a very pejorative sound to it, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> My understanding was with some of the uh, stock short sellers, they like to attack the pharma patents because mm -hmm. the stock price is very sensitive to an individual patent. Mm -hmm. They view that, and the, the reason it affects the stock price is because the, the loss of the monopoly pricing means that a competitor, a generic competitor, can jump in much more quickly. Right. <clears throat> they view that as a public good. They mm -hmm. say we're preventing monopoly pricing against the public when, they're, when the entity is not entitled to it. Right. Okay. When you say harassment, mm -hmm. what do you envision being included in that term? Okay, so the question is, what is included in the term harassment? Sure. Um, I think it's fair to say that harassment, like collective action, and for that matter, like uh, you know, designations like patent troll, can be used somewhat loosely to be you know, in the eye of the beholder. Um, my co-authors and I, and I, I wouldn't want to speak for them yet, um, haven't sort of pinned down what we think uh, the necessary and sufficient conditions for harassment ought to be. One thing we could try and answer as a step toward that might be that the reasons why the behavior is being engaged in is not what Congress intended or what the agency intended. If it's being used for an unintended uh, uh, practice, then that's a red flag right there. Now, that could be it's a feature, not a bug. And that's a, that's a perfectly valid response in a lot of cases. So then we would have to see, OK, is it unintended but foreseeable? Is it unforeseeable but still economically good? And when you start talking about things like drug patents in particular, you know, invalidating a drug patent as being a, uh, a public good, for one thing, uh, the reason it would be considered a public good today is we already have the drug that the patent covers. And so it, certainly it's a static gain. It might be a dynamic loss because the incentive for tomorrow's uh, uh, innovator, drug innovator, may not be as strong. And that's already the case with the comparative uh, institutional structures of the patent office and the courts. You don't get a clear and convincing evidence level presumption of validity in the PTAB. You don't get the Phillips claim construction standard in the PTAB. Now, the absence of those things might be justifiable if you had things like a meaningful ability to amend claims. Um, that was a, you know, quite a bit of discussion about that in Quozo. But it's still not clear uh, from what we've discussed with, uh, with practitioners whether there is a meaningful ability to amend. And even if there were, whether that would be enough to justify uh, having these, these, uh, these comparative structural differences. So if you're saying that this is going to fall if it's a bad patent, and if it were a good patent, it would survive, that's not necessarily true in a lot of cases. A perfectly valid patent that would have survived judicial review may not survive uh, administrative reevaluation for structural reasons, not for substantive reasons. Great. Other questions? Hi, Jerry Winsett from Again, Tell the Boy. Um, is there any specific data on the percentage of patents that are invalidated mm -hmm. in the administrative process versus the number of patents that are invalidated in the federal court system? Okay, question is. Uh, any data on invalidations at the federal district courts versus uh, true PTAP? Yeah. yeah, so there's, uh, there's considerable data on that. The problem with, well, the problem with some of the data is that there's not a consensus yet on how we should measure, particularly in the PTAP, 
is the denominator institutions or petitions filed? Or is it you know, stuff that makes it past discovery, things like this? Uh, in all cases, however, there is a further problem, which is selection effects. The number of patents that make it into litigation and all the way through to a validity judgment are a very small, a vanishingly small, and highly unrepresentative sample of the patent system as a whole. So whatever data we have, the question then would be, what do we use it for, and what can we infer from it? And I think the, the responsible answer is not as much as we think. Right? So it's certainly the case that if we compare just the PTAB and the, uh, the, the courts, uh, the invalidation rate, the types of patents that are challenged, patents with what attributes are challenged, uh, a lot of that data, that comparative data, is in the paper uh, that's included in your CLE materials with, uh, with Artie and Jay that I've published. And uh, it's a step toward understanding the relative effect. But I'd be very cautious about inferring too far beyond that what the absolute value of, uh, of these, these data points is on, on patent policy. Yep. Uh, Rich, being, being a patent law firm, as you know, the Okay, so the question is, mm -hmm. are you studying mistakes and bad rejections? And Richard, by the way, was uh, most serendipitous uh, addition to our group today because we met literally in the lobby of the Union League Club and told him about this event. But now you're on our list, so no more serendipity in future. <laughs> you're going to get, get uh, news about our events in our inbox, in your inbox. But, Sarah? Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly fair question, and I will say, uh, even prior to Ms. Lee's directorship, uh, Dave Kapos, when he was director, had uh, a number of initiatives uh, squarely aimed at, at patent quality. I think the question of, is this patent going to survive judicial review as a proxy for quality? You know, when we, when we want to know, are we getting patents that are good? Are we getting patents that uh, do all the things we're going to do? We're back at the beginning with that veil of incomplete information, we don't necessarily know that the understanding we have today of what non-obvious means, what subject, eligible subject matter means, is going to be stable for a long enough timeline. And for a long enough timeline, it might be something as arbitrary sounding as 20 years, but that's the, life sp that's the lifespan of a patent, right? If within the lifespan of a patent, we can reasonably expect, as we've seen in the last few years, that the Supreme Court will change the standard that we've been operating under, then I think there's a limit to what the Patent Office can do uh, institutionally. Now, let me, hold on, let me, let me just uh, uh, add to that the agreement with you that the unobserved dropout of the, the, exam, the uh, applicant who simply has no, long, you know, no longer has any resources um, has been part of some economic research that's come out of the Patent Office and may be of interest to you. 
it looks at the likelihood of getting a patent. The denominator is applications filed. The numerator is customarily patents granted. <coughs> but yeah. the grant rate or rejection rate is heavily driven, as this research shows, not necessarily by delays or things that the examiner is doing, but equally or more by how much time the applicant spends or how much resources, uh, how many resources the patent applicant has to, to commit to this. And when abandonments are driving the, the grant rate or rejection rate, then you really can't take that as a, take that statistic in its sort of uh, isolated form as a measure of what the patent office is doing right or wrong. So I agree with you that a lot more research needs to be done on um, the quality of rejections that are made and the effect that it has on shunting applicants into the RCE process. I will tell you that uh, my colleagues, uh, Melissa Wasserman and Michael Frakes, have done a lot of this, uh, this first sort of generation of empirical research on the PTO uh, examination process, where they do extensive large N sort of econometric work to, to try and tease these, these effects out. Oh, you have a follow up. Let me clarify the same situation I'm talking about. And let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to respond to that? Uh, I have Adam? just one comment Please. before we take the next question. I, I echo uh, the same sentiment that Rich is expressing because I've experienced it with my own clients, particularly small to mid-sized clients, where you know it, it just seems like a, a common pattern of discussion where they say, "Listen, you, we went through the arguments, we looked at the art, this is what we put in front of the examiner, and yet they continue to reject it. Now I got to file an RCE. Now I got to pay your fees." And I got to pay more fees to the patent office. We're thinking about pulling the plug on this entire effort because now we're getting at a point where the business people are saying, why are we spending this money when we're already competing successfully in the marketplace with mm -hmm. our product? We're getting to the point where we don't care if it's patented or not or the process we're making it is patented or not. We're just, we're, they become dissolution with the process. Mm -hmm. So I, I echo, it's, it'll be difficult for you to study, I think, as a practical matter, but it'll be, you know, it'd be worthwhile. Sure. I agree. Other questions? I have an economic and economic Introduce efficiency name and affiliation. Angelus Economo. Uh, I am uh, both, uh, have my own law firm, Economo I am an adjunct professor here and director of the patent clinic. Um, I have an economic and an efficiency question. Uh, the American Benz Act was uh, enacted basically to fix what was then called the broken patent system. And I don't know if it's achieved that objective, but um, in, in the old days, litigation was usually the only route to invalidating a patent. Right. Uh, then there was a re-examination statute passed in 1982, and subsequently we had the uh, IPRs and all that. Um, I was speaking to friends of mine who were, uh, were patent examiners when I was uh, in the office. They've told me that, uh, they've been told by management that the patent examination process is only a rough filter. 
That is, it only mm -hmm. catches some of the obvious rejections or obvious in inventions from going forward. Mm -hmm. And that <coughs> subsequent actions will, will take care of the rest. Um, so with the push to efficiency in having the USPTO through PTAB look at the, the subsequent um, subsequent actions of the, of the examiner, to, to review the actions of the examiner. Mm -hmm. Is, is the system, as it, as it now stands, is it worthwhile to have such a, a, a secondary look by the patent office because they have a, a expertise in the technology? Is, is there some efficiency mm. in that? All right. In a nutshell, so I don't mis mis paraphrase you, what would you say your question is? <laughs> Is the PTAB and the uh, IPR system that was established by the American Vence an efficient response to the prior, uh, actually, the prior problem? All right, so the question is whether the PTAB and IPR system is an efficient response to uh, the prior problem. Sure, so uh, I think your point is well taken that the PTO's examination process, not just today with the existence of a PTAB, or 30 years ago with the existence of ex parte re-exam, but for its entire history since 1836 when we had you know, reintroduced substantive examination, it's true that it was a course filter in the sense that we didn't know which of these patents that we're granting were going to be important enough economically or important enough legally to care about as a matter of correctness or not most of the good patents and most of the bad patents that have ever been issued, nobody ever cared about, right? They simply weren't worth fighting about because they were either obviously good or obviously bad, so there's no uncertainty, or they were obviously valueless, and so even if there was uncertainty, nobody wanted to invest in clarifying it, okay? So that question of how much do we know about whether this invention is gonna be worth fighting about 20 years from now, if we knew that, we could focus a lot of resources on those patents, and the ones, the, the inventions that don't matter very much, uh, or that we you know, accurately predict will not matter very much in the future, we can continue to do the same sort of ordinary level of examination that we do today. We don't know that, and absent some very strong changes in national industrial policy, I don't foresee that'll ever be the case. Uh, so the question of whether the PTAB as a second look is efficient, I would say generally yes, because all of the inventions, useful or not useful, obvious or not obvious, uh, and I'm using those terms sort of fairly loosely, uh, innovative or not innovative, valuable or not valuable, are gonna go through the process without people knowing very much about whether they're valuable uh, at the moment we're examining them. That information is only going to become available later because innovation is path dependent. When we start investing, the reason we're investing is because we have patent protection. The reason we have patent protection is we were able to secure venture capital as a startup. And the fact that we have a couple of applications in the pipeline and one granted patent available already is a strong signal to investors, right? So the cart has to, in some sense, come before the horse, uh, and there's no way to avoid that uh, unless and until we get to the point where enough information has become available about the economic importance of this patent that we'll get to see, okay, now we can have a PTAB review of this. That's basically what PGR is supposed to accomplish. Um, immediately after it's granted, we've got more information than we did when the application was filed. And so if somebody wants to fight about it, that's the time to do it. And if within that nine months nothing happens, then IPR is gonna be available for the rest of the life of the thing. CBM, if it's still around, is gonna be available for it. So as time goes on and more information becomes available, then the invention is becoming more entrenched, and if it's doing good, it's doing more good. If it's doing damage, it's doing more damage. But until we reach the point where the quality of our information matches the amount of good or harm that the patent is going to do, it's never going to be inefficient to at least have some second look available, um, is my sense. Okay, we're quickly running out of time, but we have time for one more question. So anybody from this side? Any no? internet questions come in? Okay. Nope, they've given you the monopoly. <laughs> uh, I could always close with that. We have, we have a <laughs> passive internet audience. Uh, Adam, any final questions or thoughts? Um, I think one, one additional consideration uh, for why 
uh, some patents maybe are being tested after they're issued, is that, in, and this is something I've discussed with a lot of my buddies with MBAs, whether it's you know Kellogg, Booth, wherever, insert name of school, is that in the last 30 years, business schools have been placing an emphasis on their curriculum for, count, for advising and teaching uh, C-suite members mm. to effectively monetize intellectual property rights. And I think you, what you have in the consciousness of people who run business units for both uh, small, mid-sized, and large companies is that they want to, they want to recoup and, and monetize their IP assets. So let's just take patents, for example. You know, of course you can license it. Well, what's the power of a license? Well, maybe it covers some good product. Maybe there's a real threat of enforcement. And I think once they start using these IP rights as a sword uh, in order to monetize them, I think that's something literally, if you go back in the 30 years, that's why I have so much patent litigation. Mm. I just think you have more educated business folks who are, are leveraging their IP assets, um, at least in, in my experience. I think that's right. I think the, you know, the, the first, if you go back to like the first uh, member of a corporate board who ever saw a patent portfolio languishing in the basement and thought, hey, we could turn this into money and all of a sudden everything's coming up Millhouse. When you actually uh, start educating you know, the, the current generation, but equally the next generation of, uh, of uh, business professionals about the need to think about this in a systematic fashion, that's the same trend we're seeing in public policy. For a long time, patent policy was really the purview of the patent office and you'd have the, the agency director, the commissioner for patents, they were the folks who were sort of opining on this. Now we've got the FTC, their office of policy planning, the DOJ antitrust division, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, in some cases involving uh, the technology uh, underlying you know, communications networks. You've got the, the NIH office of technology transfer. All these government agencies across the executive branch uh, are starting to formulate a much more coherent um, government level policy, not just an agency level policy. And there are going to be dislocations along the way. There are going to be people who have a different perspective. They think about it from a competition law or an economic policy perspective, not just a patents as property rights perspective. And that's going to lead to different answers to the same questions. But I think that as we get better at this, as data improves, as the quality of economic research and legal research on this improves, we're going to see the same sorts of uh, maturations that we've seen uh, on the corporate side. And, uh, and hopefully it'll all be toward a more uh, efficient system of, of innovation. You just reminded me of something. I, I saw this a few weeks ago, the Department of Justice issued their, what they believe their guidelines uh, for licensing intellectual property rights mm -hmm. uh, so that you don't run afoul of antitrust issues. It's a worth, worthwhile read. If you haven't seen it, uh, I suggest a, a, a nice Chianti while doing so. <laughs> um, <laughs> well done. Yeah. All right, I know Sir Rob. Or a single malt, preferably PD. I'm all that. So, so Rob's going to be around for a while. So folks that have got more questions, I want to just chat with him. Uh, please feel free to do so. But Absolutely. please join me in thanking uh, Sir Rob and Adam Kelly for their time. Thank you.